Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief and Chief Content Officer at Worth Media. I'm here at the Lake Nona Impact Forum. We've got a very special guest for you today, Dean Kamen, the founder and inventor of many, many things, which you're going to hear about today, has just left the stage. We saw some amazing things on that stage. Um, I've got a list of questions here, but I'm going to follow your moderating style that you taught me 45 minutes ago, which is forget about the questions. Uh, just trying to describe what we saw on stage just a couple of moments ago. Well, a couple of moments ago, we had on stage a woman named Doris Taylor, who has spent most of her life pursuing a vision that, at least when she started, most people thought was insane. She said, we've got to find a way to replace failing hearts because it's the number one cause of death among humans. Uh, she gave the statistics on how, what percentage of all of us, unless we do something, are going to die of heart disease. And over the last couple of decades, she's gone far enough that she understands the science. She understands the physiology. She was able to take, for instance, uh, these are uh, pig hearts that she decellularized. And then with some help from us uh, and some robotic capability, we reinfused into those scaffolds of a heart living cells from a human that will be the beneficiary of them. And as you saw, those hearts started to function. They started to beat in a laboratory environment. And if we put cells into them that happen to have the DNA of who will be then the recipient, not only will you not have to wait for somebody to die to give you a cadaver heart that 20% of the people waiting for hearts every year die because there isn't one available, but if you do get a heart and if you don't reject it because it's not your genes, you're going to be taking immunosuppressives for the rest of your life, which are very expensive and they leave you vulnerable to all sorts of issues. So we said, if we can only create a baseline capability to take the science that she's now delivered, the formula, if we can take that miracle in a Petri dish and figure out how to scale it up to the hundreds of thousands of hearts that need to be custom manufactured that for the people that need a replacement art, we can transform healthcare. And as I said there, it's not just hearts that don't have infrastructure. There's no infrastructure for the manufacture of replacement human organs. So about six years ago, I said, look, we're engineers. We're not scientists. We're not clinicians. We're not physiologists. We don't know what the magic goo is. But in every major med school in this country, in every research lab, there are scientists that are, that are starting to really understand you know, the formula of life itself at the genetic level. But there's never been an industry to bring it to scale. You know, you got a great idea for a new car thing, you go to Detroit, there's infrastructure mm -hmm. there. You don't have to invent steel and iron and glass and rubber and tires, there's an industry. If you have a great idea in the world of semiconductors, you go to Silicon Valley. It's not just a, a phrase. There really is a whole ecosystem. There's infrastructure to make wafers, to do hardware and software and firmware. There's, there's an enormous industry to make it possible to move forward quickly. But even if you finally can make one heart, where are you going to get the capability to do it at scale, to do it at high quality, to do the number of people really are waiting for, to get it through the FDA, to meet the regulatory requirements which don't even exist. There is no infrastructure, there's no industry. So I said six years ago, well, Detroit's got cars and, and Silicon Valley's got semiconductors. Let them build silicon future. We've got to build the carbon future. So I went to a whole bunch of folks, and we now have 190 member organizations, every major med school, and all the companies that make everything from the sophisticated capabilities for aerospace component to semiconductor. And I said, we've got to take the expertise you each have that has created these other industries that make high quality, high quantity stuff at realistic cost. Let's take all this expertise, bring it together, and figure out how to scale up the ability to manufacture replacement human organs, kidneys, livers, lungs, and we're doing it. And I wanted Doris on stage because I thought if a bunch of people that don't realize this is going on saw a pancreas, it might not have as much impact as a beating heart. Yeah. So I said, I want the poster child for what Army is doing to be a woman that deserves that kind of recognition, and that's Doris Taylor, and I thought she did a great job of explaining the path she took to get to where she is. 
So when I hear you say that, it's, you're really talking about the industrialization of the manufacturing of human organs. We are going to industrialize the process of manufacturing or placement human organs. And uh, I mean, so what we saw, the process just for the human heart, you're taking, the, she's taking a pig heart, she's extracting all of the pig blood cells from it. Not she's, just blood cells, all the cells. All the cells, all the, all the or, and, and so you basically just have a framework of a heart. It's a scaffold that has the size and shape and the ductwork and the structure that you need, and if you recellularize it, but you use your cells, you suddenly have yourself a nice replacement heart. But e even that became like an engineering problem because you know they had these uh, scaffolded hearts, they were feeding them, they're testing them, they're working on them, but they needed constant maintenance because the hearts needed to be fed three times a day. Um, and then when the power went out down in Houston, when the hurricane hit, they lost a lot of those scaffolds and those hearts. So you stepped in there with a solution to help sort of incubate these hearts. There are scientists that know how to build things one at a time, which makes complete sense when you're doing the design and the development of anything. You do it one at a time. But then typically, once you've finished your design, you turn it over to the industry that knows how to scale. You wrote your book, mm -hmm. but you turned it over to the guys that know how to run the printing presses, and your magazine's gonna come out next month, but you didn't write a great article and then have to figure out how to invent a printing press. Mm -hmm. So. What are we going to do with all these great scientific achievements? We're working now with people that are making islet cells that can do what a pancreas does and eliminate diabetes. We're working with people so we can make a new cornea so you won't be blind due to macular degeneration. We have all these scientists that know how to make each one of these functions, but none of them have the capacity to go to scale, and they, there's no place for them to go to. So I said, We'll just build the baseline pre-competitive technologies so that every one of these science fair projects will become an available organ for people that are desperately waiting for them. And you're structured as a nonprofit? It's a so non-for-profit. Now we're up to 190 members. It took me six years to get to 190 members there, but as I said, if they doubt that we're gonna do this, I have 3,700 members in FIRST, and we're in 81,000 schools, and we keep going and we keep growing. And if you give people a mission and you give them clarity and they see results, it's amazing what you can do. And FIRST is an absolute nonprofit and it has tens of millions of hours of passionate professionals dedicated to it all year long. And we're going to get Army to a place where it will start supplying all the pre-competitive capabilities that all of these scientists are going to need to satisfy the needs of, of 8 billion people that need organs. And I think you, you also brought up on stage that the reason this is so important, it's very obvious in the heart, heart disease area where a third kill, heart disease kills a third of every uh, person in America, but um, there are a ton of systemic chronic conditions that are tied to various types of organ ailments and organ failure, yeah. and that would have a huge impact on people's lifespans in the United States. And the cost of health care. The only thing that's really expensive in healthcare is the chronic, never-ending cost. Look, my day job, I've got 900 engineers and we design and build probably 80% of the world's home peritoneal dialysis machine comes from my place. I've shipped lots and lots of technology to solve chronic needs. I'm making the next generation of insulin pumps for kids that'll get a smaller, better pump than the ones I made 40 years ago with motors that are still And you said current. no moving parts? No, it's all solid state and it's really neat. And you heard somebody sitting up there from Harvard School of Public Health saying, I wish there was a way to let people give themselves a vaccine intradermally without big needles. We're going through a test now in animals on a way to do that with micro needles. We're making with semiconductor technology. but. But the vision that we had for Army was, look, let's figure out how to end the need for chronically treating people with diabetes by giving them insulin every day. Let's give them a new pancreas. Let's stop needing to give people dialysis every other day for the rest of their life. Let's give them a new kidney. Let's give people a new heart, because in that case, typically your life is very short. But look, I make all this other stuff I want to put myself out of that business. You know, innovation's not going to stop. I don't want it to stop. I just want to be on the innovation bus, not under it. And I don't want to be part of the old guard that's hanging on to the industries that are making a lot of money by giving chronic care to people that would prefer to have a cure. I want to develop the cure.
So we saw the, the, the hearts on stage uh, in containers. Um, the, the claim was that this will be ready to deploy this in five years. So I, she's very optimistic and I think realistic about the amount of time it'll take to be able to do it. I don't think she was being overly optimistic. The issue we're gonna have is how long will it take to get through the regulatory process at the Food and Drug Administration. And if it turns out that for various reasons it can be treated like you know, compassionate use, if, it, for, if, if Army can build so many good systems to satisfy all the requirements of quality and quantity, uh, it might happen within five years. That's amazing. Dean, thanks so much for taking time to talk to us today. You're very welcome. We appreciate it. This has been Worth Media. If you want to find out more about these stories, check out worth.com. Stay tuned.